May I request Manish Purohit? Yes, you are, Manish. Here you go. Hold on. I'll hold it like this. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Manish Purohit, and I work for a company called Authors Upfront. Uh, we are a self-publishing platform, and we have helped many authors publish their work. Uh, this is also facilitated by Authors Upfront, and this is uh, my probably 20th book with Paranjoy. So thank you so much, Paranjoy. Maybe a little more? Probably 24. 24th, okay. And uh, probably, hopefully, we'll reach the number 50 soon. So welcome. Today uh, we are going to have a discussion on uh, loose pages. Uh, this is the second discussion uh, followed by the launch in uh, late November at the Press Club, which received a very, very good response. Uh, I would like to thank uh, uh, Mr. Prashant Bhushan and Justice A.P. Shah to have come here and uh, agreed to address the gathering. May I request you to please... Uh, I, I think let's do without this. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I think... Is it better with the mic? Yeah. Uh, because the sound is very, very... Uh, uh, we've been working together now for almost five years. And uh, we, are, we entered this enterprise of publishing books at a time when we were told that people don't read, have stopped reading. And uh, some years ago when I met a young person like the author of this book, who said he had read uh, a book that we, the, our first book that we uh, worked on that was called Gas Wars, Crony Capitalism and the Ambani's. And I said, oh, I'm so happy you've uh, read the book. He said, no, no, I downloaded it online. Uh, and I said, oh, I see. Uh, how much did you pay for it? He said, no, no, I didn't pay for it at all. So uh, when I contacted Manish, <laughs> and I said, Manish, here's this young man who's already got the book, downloaded, he showed it to me. He showed, it, he showed me the book that he'd got it. So Manish was very kind. He said, congratulations. And here I was fuming and I said, four and a half years of work. I mean, there is something I thought called intellectual property rights. He says, no, 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 congratulations. Uh, your book is doing well. Otherwise, it wouldn't have been pirated. So uh, pirates pick on books that sell. And those of us who publish for us, it's uh, often a hit and a miss game because we don't know which book will become popular and which won't. So that's a little digression. I'm very happy the lady at the back, Shobha Sengupta. Shobha, come here for half a minute. She is the person who runs this art gallery and this bookstore. And she is, thanks to her, we are here. And. Uh, Come, come here half a minute, Shobha, please. For her too, it's been a, a huge, a risky proposition to take space in a place like this where rents are very high and sell works of art and books. So thank you, Shobha, for facilitating. Thank you for being here. Thank you. It's such an honor for me. OK. Uh, but before I introduce the speakers and the guests here, I want to introduce a young man. I mean, I mean, I mean, he. Uh, I was under the. I was under a misconceived notion. Here, here, here. Sorry, you sit here. Or sit in the middle. That he was 24 years old, but he corrected me. He's all of 21. Please sit. And and he's the author of the book. I mean, uh, my name is been appended there. Uh, I'm 63, he's, he's, he's the future of this country, people like him are. Yes, I, I piled him with thousands of pages of documents, but more importantly, he was not only able to go through all of it and digest it, he was able to tell a story. So I'm extremely grateful to Surya, as he would like to be called. He's a Probashi Bangali. I, I would have normally, if I was in Kolkata, I would have been a Shourjo. But Surya and I, we uh, 
came, got to know each other when he was working, uh, worked for a brief period of time as an intern with the Economic and Political Weekly. He was then a student of sociology at Hindu College at the University of Delhi. He's now a student at uh, Jawaharlal Nehru University. He's uh, studying sociology. So I'm extremely happy and grateful that Surya was able to do all the, all the hard work, all the difficult work in putting together this volume. I'm, I'm extremely happy today to welcome our speakers here, Justice Ajit Prakash Shah really needs no introduction. He was a former judge of the High Court of Delhi. He's a former chairman of the Law Commission of this country. And, and uh, there are very, very few judges like him who not only speak their mind, and uh, it was not surprisingly that he, he is, because he speaks his mind, he... Uh, may have been holding more important positions, but for reasons that are obvious to most of you, he was not elevated to the position of a judge of the Apex Court. I don't want to elaborate further on this, but all I can say that as a person who's well versed in the law, he is among the rare judges who speaks his mind freely, frankly, without currying favor from anybody. I want to also thank Prashant Bhushan, who is here. Prashant Bhushan really no, needs no introduction. He's not just a lawyer, an advocate. He's an activist. He's a political activist. He is perhaps one of the few, perhaps the only, lawyer of his kind, who's taken on the establishment. I mean, he's done, I mean, he's held truth to power. He's taken on the high and the mighty, not only within the judiciary, but within the political establishment. And I truly uh, consider it my honor and my privilege that I've had occasion uh, to have interacted with him. On occasions, I publicly disagreed with him, but he is uh, such a warm-hearted and a large-hearted person. That he was one of the few people who once gave me a blank sheet of paper. And this book is actually all about blank sheets of paper and loose pages. But he gave me a blank sheet of paper and I said, you sign this piece of paper. <coughs> I said, what is this for? He said, this is going to be a vakalat nama. And willy-nilly I became a petitioner in what became known as the 2G spectrum scam case. A lot of my Friends, they're saying, what's gone wrong with you? You're a journalist. When did you start becoming a litigant or an activist? And when the Delhi High Court threw, threw the petition out and it went to the Supreme Court, uh, they said, yeah, we told you, no? Stick to your journalism. Why are you getting into all this litigation? Be that as it may, when the Supreme Court not only heard the case, one in February 2012, uh, the Supreme Court cancelled 122 licenses. Some of the same people got back to me. Congratulations, because suddenly the Supreme Court got my name wrong, which is OK. Uh, but they said congratulations from becoming a, a news breaker. You're becoming a news maker. And I felt suitably flattered. But that, I, I'm, this uh, occasion is not about myself. This occasion is about the book that we've published. It took us a few years to put it together. It, a lot of people, we, we, we heard a lot about the nexus between business and politics. What we've tried to do is through three or four case studies, three case studies really, the, the Birla papers, the Sahara papers, and the former Arunachal chief minister, Kalikopul's suicide note, try to highlight how the judiciary and the higher judiciary in particular, in more ways than one, uh, according to us, has been complicit in cementing this nexus and furthering it. So that's all I'm going to say. And I'm going to ask Soria to say a few words. And then we'll ask Prashant Bhushan to speak. And then Justice A.P. Shah said he'd rather be reacting to some of the things that have been said than making a speech. So after that, 
we've spoken. You should feel free to ask any question you want to any of us. And thank you once again for coming here uh, on a holiday, on a holiday evening. Thank you. Those of you who haven't had tea and some biscuits and snacks, feel free. And then I'll have a snack. The chai is going to be here. The first round of tea is over. But there are some samosas and biscuits. Please start. Uh, First of all, I'd like uh, to welcome everyone. <coughs> I'd like to welcome everyone for giving their time on a weekend and attending this little discussion on the book. Um, so, uh, bef since we are past the introductions, I'll talk a bit about the book. Uh, as you know, like uh, this isn't breaking news. When we wrote this book, it wasn't this great muckraking job where we found a lot of facts which hadn't been spoken about, which hadn't been reported. But we felt that it hadn't been reported enough or not been spoken about to the extent that it deserved uh, attention. Uh, what we have tried to do with this book is to, when we see these items in the news, it often hits us as this unconnected developments of corruption. And corruption has been an issue that has been in the public sphere. I mean, as an important issue, especially since the last elections, it was, it was a decider for the outcome of the elections. But to actually see the role that corruption and what is now being called crony capitalism, the kind of the economic system that we have in our country, uh, what is the role of corruption in that? In business as usual for it to run, what is the role that corruption plays? And uh, uh, Anja has written extensively about this nexus between the uh, corporations and politicians and bureaucrats. But what was new with this book and something that hasn't been uh, perhaps discussed as much as it has been in other liberal democracies, um, is the role of the judiciary. I mean, when we talk about the government, I mean, we often leave out the fact that it's a part of a state which consists of the legislature and the executive and the judiciary. And all three of them have, at some point, uh, to work in cohesion for business to run as it is run. Uh, so these are particular, I mean, these papers was very interesting for me especially. Uh, because we're used to a particular kind of common sense about how businesses are and their objectives and everything. But it's very rare that you get papers which are internal correspondences from big business houses. It's very rare that you can look under uh, the curtain and see what's actually going on. And what you find is absolutely astounding that there are, uh, if these papers are to be believed, then there are basically these business houses have uh, been making spreadsheets, have been making have their internal servers where these communications happen on a daily basis in which it is planned in which way uh, important public policy regarding the allocation of scarce natural resources will be planned and perhaps molded to suit their interests. And when writing this book, uh, that was our intention, that it wasn't just about the case itself, which we have documented as uh, elaborately as we could about the evidence and the technicalities of the uh, the verdict which was ultimately passed uh, in uh, a case involving uh, common cause where Mr. Bhushan was the advocate, was representing the petitioners. Uh, but also, I mean, this entire system, I mean, using this as a case study to see how business is run in this country. And uh, perhaps, I mean, uh, the speakers here are uh, well, way more well versed with this topic and have been involved in many attempts to even reform the judiciary. Uh, but right now when we speak, and uh, especially uh, with the current BJP government in power, what we are seeing is several public institutions being hollowed out, attacked systematically, and uh, not being allowed to function. And it's now, it's very much, for me personally at least, it's very much an open question about whether these institutions can indeed be reformed. For example, what this book deals with extensively is the autonomy of the Central Bureau of Investigation. But the Central Bureau of Investigation has always been under the central government. And there have been several attempts, it is documented in this book, to reform the CBI, make it more autonomous from political manipulation. And now with uh, the, the spat within the CBI, which has become public now, it's very much open how, I mean, it's very much an open question whether these institutions have been taken over uh, and have uh, any scope for reform. So I think we should now begin the discussion. Yeah. I'm going to 
request Prashant Bhushan to be the first speaker, and after him, Justice Shah can comment on the, the uh, what has been said so far. And uh, after that, we can have a open house. So, for me, the Birla Sahara saga started when. Uh, <coughs> In a way, it started uh, even before the appointment of this present CVC, K.V. Chaudhary as the CVC, as the Chief Vigilance Commissioner of the Central Vigilance Commission, when uh, several well-informed people came and told me that uh, <clears throat> he is the front runner for the job. He, was, he had uh, retired as the chairman of the Central Board of Direct Taxes for a very long time. He was the head of investigations. He was uh, the Director General of Investigations of Income Tax. Thereafter, the member investigation in the Central Board of Direct Taxes. Thereafter, he became the chairman for a brief while. Thereafter, he became, he was appointed as soon as this Modi government came <coughs> and they set up this SIT on black money. They appointed him as the advisor to that SIT. And uh, I started getting news around that time that since the post of the Central uh, Chief Vigilance Commissioner and another Vigilance Commissioner, two out of the three posts were lying vacant. And we had filed a petition for filling up those posts. We started getting information that uh, this K.V. Chaudhary is likely to be appointed the Chief Vigilance Commissioner. And simultaneously, the reasons also were told to me. They said that, look, as the Director General of Investigations and as Member Investigations, he was overseeing the income tax raids that took place over the Sahara group of companies, as well as the papers which the CBI had recovered in raids from the Birla group of companies, which were handed over to the income tax. And uh, that these people, <coughs> The papers that uh, were recovered by income tax and the CBI in these rates show large payments being made to Mr. Modi, who was the Prime Minister at that time. And he has played the... Chief Minister. No, 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 no. He was the Chief Minister when the payments were made. But uh, he has the Prime Minister. Right. At the time when... Chaudhary's name was being considered for being appointed as the Chief Vigilance Commissioner. Modi was the Prime Minister. And the information that I kept getting from several sources, independent sources, was that he is now being considered for this top job in the Central Vigilance Commission because he has played the key role in hiding the documents which were recovered by income tax and CBI, which showed large payments made to Mr. Modi in 2013 by the Birla group of companies as well as by the Sahara group of companies. And uh, at that very time, I not only <coughs> tweeted this, I had just started a Twitter account at that time before his appointment. I also wrote a letter to the Prime Minister saying that, look, um, and that paper and that letter was leaked to the media or given to the media, which pointed out that, which said that, look, we have learned that he is the front runner and that there are the following problems with him. A, that he played a role in that stock guru scam in which income tax officers were being investigated, senior income tax officers were being investigated by the CBI. And to negotiate that, he had visited this Ranjit Sanha, this crook, the CBI director, who is now being investigated by an SIT set up by the Supreme Court. And he had uh, visited him in order to settle this matter. 
that he had played a role in <laughs> in illegally dealing with an income tax assessment of this Ponte Chadha, Ponte Chadha's company by which he had virtually waived a tax amount of more than 100 crores. Uh, he, he had no business to interfere with that uh, assessment, but he did. And we also mentioned this fact about uh, that he appears to have played some role in this. Now, <clears throat> nothing happened. What, what I learned was that uh, what happened as a result of that was Mr. Jait Balani also wrote some similar letter to the Prime Minister. And what happened as a result was that his name got stalled for about a couple of months. Because then they started uh, looking at how to <coughs> cover this up and so on. And once they found a way to cover it up, they promptly appointed him. We challenged his appointment. The second person who was appointed was a gentleman, I've forgotten his name. Huh? PM no, no. Uh, he was the chairman of a central bank, public sector bank. And as chairman of the public sector bank, he had uh, fabricated a confidential report of one very senior officer of that bank fabricated and the Central Vigilance Commission itself had held him guilty of fabricating that report and had recommended disciplinary proceedings Did against him. Bhaseen, Bhaseen. But sure enough, these two very persons came to be appointed, Chaudhary and Bhaseen. And uh, we filed a petition on behalf of Common Cause challenging their appointments. That petition went on. It was before Justice Kher, who was at that time a puny judge in court number three, I think. And then it slowly progressed. As it progressed, he came to court number two. At that time, after these people had been appointed, we somehow laid our hands. Some whistleblower came and gave me these documents which were recovered in the Birla Sahara raids, the critical documents showing. Now, in the case of the Sahara group of companies, it consisted of a spreadsheet. And that spreadsheet contained, had some five, six, six columns. It showed, and there were about 40 entries in that spreadsheet. That spreadsheet was signed by the income tax officers who had recovered those documents, including one witness from the Sahara, one senior officer of Sahara, and several income tax officers who signed that spreadsheet. So I knew that this was authentic. So it showed cash payments received on one side were cash payments received on different dates by this Sahara. On the other side, it showed cash payments disbursed to different people on different dates. But the interesting thing about this spreadsheet was it not only showed the amounts of cash disbursed, named the person to whom it was disbursed, it also showed where that money was paid, whether it was paid in Delhi or Jaipur or, or Bhopal or Ahmedabad, it also showed who was the person in whose hands the payment was made. It also showed who was the person who went and delivered this cash. So it was a very, very detailed spreadsheet. It contained payments running into 135 crores. And it showed on the other side payments received of 100 and cash received of 137 crores. Most of the cash received is shown to have been received on different dates. Dates are mentioned. For each payment, dates are mentioned. Place of payment, who went and paid, in whose hand it was paid, for whose benefit it has been paid. Everything is mentioned. The, uh, on the other hand, it shows payments received, uh, sorry, cash received. And most of the cash received on different dates, different amounts. 
are shown to have been received by one Marcom, which is the marketing communication company of Sahara. So, this was the primary document so far as the Sahara raids were concerned. Out of the 135 crores paid, 40 crores on 9 different dates in 9 tranches is the payment shown to have been made to the Chief Minister of Gujarat, who happened to be Narendra Modi at that time. There are payments to Shivraj Singh Chauhan totaling 10 crores, there are payments to Raman Singh totaling 4 crores, there are payments to Sheila Dixit totaling 1 crore and there are various other people to whom payments are shown. The Birla documents that we received were documents showing. So, what we found was that in this raid they recovered 25 crores in cash that was reported in the newspapers also. Even in the Sahara raid they recovered a lot of cash. The Birla documents had many things. There were a huge treasure trove of documents. It had some kind of diary containing notes of different payments being made to different people, payments being received from Hawala dealers, etc. It had um, some cryptic entries about payments being made to the Ministry of Environment for environmental clearances for different Birla companies on different dates. So, uh, many such things. It had also these emails, etc., internal emails of the group president of Birla, which showed payments being made to officers of the customs department for favors and exemptions of customs duty. It showed uh, and there was one particular entry which says 25 crores Gujarat CM, 12 paid, 13 balance or something like that. 12 crores paid, 13 balance, hmm. something like that. So, <clears throat> We thought that, well, this is very significant evidence which certainly warrants an investigation. I mean, certainly calls for an investigation. If these are the documents recovered by the income tax and the CBI in raids from Birla and Sahara, which prima facie show large amounts of cash payments to various politicians, particularly the sitting prime minister at the time when he was chief minister of Gujarat in the run up to the elections certainly warrants a serious investigation. Now, our dilemma was, should we file a fresh petition or should we file an application in the pending case of the CVC, where we had challenged the appointment of the CVC because it was linked to this Chaudhary. I just, Gujarat CM 25 crores 12 done hyphen rest question mark. Right. So, now we thought about it a great deal whether we should because now the dilemma was this and this is a real problem when it comes to the courts these days because you can very often tell the outcome of a case from the face of the judge who is going to hear it. Unfortunately, this is the truth. This is the unfortunate truth. Now, if we filed a fresh petition, it would go before the then sitting Chief Justice, who was at that time Justice Thakur. If, it, if we filed an application in the pending matter of the CVC, it would go before Justice Kher, before whom that matter was being uh, heard. We realized that this is a matter involving in, uh, investigation of the Prime Minister, sitting Prime Minister. And there would be, in order to order an investigation against a sitting prime minister, you need to have a judge who is not only honest, but really tough. And we felt that uh, Justice Kher would probably be the tougher of the two. We felt that both were honest, but Justice Kher is likely to be tougher. So, we filed an application in the pending CVC matter. 
as it happened, something happened, <laughs> it seems, soon after we filed this application. Do not know what happened. But the response of the bench was very, very unexpected. And uh, with the result that uh, on one particular hearing, the uh, bench was very keen. Justice Kher was still in court number 2. His appointment as Chief Justice had not yet been announced. It was due in another 15 days. The Chief Justice, sitting Chief Justice, Justice Thakur was retiring within 15 days. And uh, we just got hold of four volumes, just two days before that hearing, we got hold of four volumes of the income tax appraisal report in the Birla case. And that appraisal report is absolutely mind blowing. That income tax appraisal report not only authenticates each one of the documents recovered, but it substantiates everything that is said in those documents, including payments made to ABCD, etc., except that it does not deal with the payment made to Modi. But all the other things, payments made to environment, payments made to so and so, how Hawala dealers used to come and pay them the money and the cash used to be disbursed to various public servants, etc. Everything had been authenticated by the income tax department in that more than 1000 page appraisal report. So, on that hearing, I told Justice Kher, Ki, look, I have just got this four volumes and I will need to file. Now, I wanted an adjournment because I knew that he was probably under pressure because of his impending appointment at Chief Just as Chief Justice, which had been held up by the government. So, <clears throat> I said that uh, please adjourn this matter till beyond the vacations, so that I may, because the winter vacations were coming, it was after another two days, the winter vacations would start and the court would reopen on the 2nd of January. On the 3rd of January, his appointment was to take place. So, I said that, all right, uh, please adjourn it till after the vacations. Let me file a response to this. Uh, let me file a uh, supplementary affidavit uh, giving these documents, a very important set of documents that I have just received. He said, no, no, I must hear it today. No adjournment. Then I had to tell him, Ki, look, uh, I think uh, your file is pending with the Prime Minister. Your file of being appointed as Chief Justice is pending with the Prime Minister. This case deals with the Prime Minister. Therefore, it would not be appropriate for you to hear this matter right now. You adjourn it till after the vacations when one way or the other, whether you are appointed Chief Justice or not appointed Chief Justice, things would be clear. But at this point, there would be a conflict of interest in your hearing the matter at this point of time. He got very annoyed. In fact, this Justice uh, Mishra who was sitting with him, he also said this is contempt of court, etc. But anyway, so he finally said that yes. I will have to either adjourn the matter or if you want, this Mukul Rohatgi who was appearing for the government, he was shouting that, no, no, you must hear it today. So, he said, if you want it to be heard today, I will place it before the Chief Justice today itself to nominate a bench today. But you tell me, do you want it to be heard today, in which case I will not hear it. If you want it after the vacations, I will hear it. So, Mukul Rohatgi finally said, all right, have it after the vacations. So, it was listed after the vacations. He was appointed Chief Justice, matter was listed, but it was listed before a new bench headed by this Justice Mishra, not Deepak Mishra, the other Mishra, Arun Mishra. Arun Mishra. Now, Arun Mishra used to sit in court 12, so it was listed before court 12. He, of course, heard the matter. I mean, he gave me a patient hearing for about two hours, two and a half hours or so. But after that, he had come with a predetermined mind. He immediately dictated an order saying that these are all loose, loose papers. This is the title of this book. 
and these loose papers cannot be the basis for any investigation, which was totally contrary to the orders in so many cases, including that famous Vinit Narayan case where the Thawala case, where on the basis of a similar diary, not only did the Supreme Court order a CBI investigation, but kept monitoring it for quite some time. It is another matter that the court said that, well, only on the basis of this evidence, we cannot convict. You must have some further corroborative evidence. Unfortunately, in that investigation, the CBI did not even look at the assets of the people who were named in that case, whether they had come into possession of disproportionate assets or not. But anyway, the, uh, this is so far as the Birla Sahara case is concerned. So, they dismissed it. One interesting fact which we learnt at that time was that this uh, Justice Mishra his nephew's wedding was held at his house during that winter vacations. And the who's who from the BJP, anybody and you can, you can accept Modi. Modi did not attend that wedding. Modi knew that his case was going to be listed before him, but Modi did not attend. But everybody else from Amit Shah to Arun Jaitley to Vasundara Rajet, everybody attended that wedding of his nephew, which was at his residence. And this Shivraj Singh Chauhan, who is named as having received 10 crores in the Sahara papers, also went to his house to greet him for his nephew's wedding. And that photograph of Shivraj Singh at his residence, <coughs> greeting him at his nephew's wedding, was published by a local newspaper, which I had also tweeted at that time. So, one of the questions which, of course, at that time we uh, did not know and did not raise this objection that he had a conflict of interest and therefore he should not hear it. Because, you see, the principle that has been laid down in the code of conduct for judges is that judges should keep aloof from politicians unless they are their personal friends. So, the fact that you invite politicians to your nephew's wedding would show that they are your personal friends. And if they are your personal friends, then you have no business to be hearing the cases which directly involve them. But he proceeded to hear the matter, proceeded to dismiss it, make short shrift of it. So, this whole saga actually casts very, very unfortunate light on the functioning of several institutions in this country. Firstly, the CBI and the income tax itself. You see, CBI raided Birla. CBI recovered these documents from Birla, which clearly showed corrupt practices, bribes being paid to the Ministry of Environment, etc. But instead of registering an FIR and investigating that crime, which was clearly within their jurisdiction, they just handed over the papers to income tax. And income tax, after having appraised it and having found that indeed these payments have been made, bribes have been paid, income tax does not refer the matter back to the CBI. And in the other case of Sahara, income tax raids finds clearly documents which show payments being made, bribes effectively, bribes being paid to political servants and so on, but does nothing, does not, I mean prepares an appraisal report and eventually all these matters went to the settlement commission where they are all settled for just pay some nominal penalty and that is the end of the matter. So, no criminal investigation and the CVC who is supposed to have supervisory jurisdiction over the CBI, that is appointed the same gentleman who is also involved in this Alok Verma's case, etc., this K. V. Chaudhary. And when you go to the Supreme Court, this is what you find happening in the Supreme Court. So, what we have found, this, this, these cases are just examples of what happens normally when evidence is unearthed by any agency, 
or by any uh, member of the public involving corruption in the highest places. Now, in this case, in the Birla case, it is particularly interesting because each and every person named as having been paid bribes in that case are people from the UPA government. The only person who is named from the BJP or the NDA is Modi, that 25 crores. But because he was named, the BJP government did not bother, though Modi kept saying Jayanti tax, Jayanti tax during the campaign, that Jayanti Natarajan was getting bribes for getting, giving environmental clearances. But here there was stark evidence of this Jayanti Natarajan collecting bribes, stark, written in black and white, but nothing. No investigation will be done because any investigation would also mean investigation of that 25 crores to Modi. So, therefore, what we have found is that when you have this kind of a case showing corruption in the highest places, like Rafael, for example, nothing will be done. And no court, as I said, for the court to act on such a case, you not only require a very honest judge with no chinks in his armor, who cannot be blackmailed in any way by the government, but also a judge who is really tough, because even honest judges who are not really tough wilt when, I mean there it is a lack of nerve. They show lack of nerve when it comes to ordering investigation against the Prime Minister or against somebody at the highest places or against the chief justice, sitting chief justice as we see happened in that medical college scam case, etcetera. So, therefore, uh, these are the lessons. I could talk about the Calico pool case, but I do not think it is necessary. Huh? Uh, before I, uh, there is more tea coming, there are still more snacks, so be a little patient, it will be here in a very short while from now. Okay, uh, I just want to add two or three points to what Prashant said. Uh, there, are, there is the records uh, that were seized by the CBI and then passed on to the income tax department, did mention the J factor, the J. And before that, you know, we had been hearing Mr. Modi himself talking about the Jayanti tax. For Mr. Modi, before the election, the Jayanti tax symbolized what was wrong, crony capitalism, bribes being played, the corruption of the UPA government. In fact, soon after Rahul Gandhi gave a speech at the uh, gathering of the Federation of Indian Chambers of Commerce and Industry, uh, Jayanti Natarajan was asked to leave her post. Now, the interesting thing is, I do not know how much closer you can get. The entries made of payments allegedly made matched perfectly with the clearances, with the environmental clearances that had been obtained by the group, various group companies. I mean, so what was truly amazing for us to say, and this is what the book deals with in some detail is what is evidence. The Indian Evidence Act is more than a hundred years old. And there it says that unless the sheets are, the loose pages are bound in pieces of twine, you cannot consider them to be records of account kept. I mean that was truly amazing for us to look at the reasons given by the honorable judges to not include the material that was provided to them, signed, countersigned by government officials as evidence. There is a chapter in the book which deals with the circumstances that lead, uh, that led to the suicide of the former chief minister of Arunachal Pradesh. Before he hung himself to death in the official residence of the chief minister of Arunachal Pradesh in Itanagar, he had spent a few days writing a detailed 60 page note in Hindi, countersigned on each page, which detailed the circumstances where he made a series of allegations. 
against people associated with two former chief justices of India, uh, the former president of India, Bharat Ratna Pranab Kumar Mukherjee, uh, various important functionaries and ministers, including the present chief minister of Madhya Pradesh, among others. And, and what we did, I mean, we realized that we were sitting on explosive material. And we also had to do something. So what uh, we decided, we sent letters to all these people, to all the players, Mr. Kumar Mangalam Birla, Mr. Subrata Roy Sahara, uh, Justice Kehar, uh, Justice uh, Deepak Mishra, Mr. Kamal Nath, Mr. Pranab Mukherjee, uh, the, the Chief Minister of Puducherry, Mr. Narayan Swami, uh, Mr. Kapil Sibyl, eminent lawyer. It was a good two months before the book was published. We've, we've given the annexures. In the annexures, the question is, and we said, please respond. We didn't want to be seen as being biased, not giving the other side. We sent emails to them on their official email IDs. We, we actually uh, put, we, we had evidence that we uh, send it by good old India Post. So we have, uh, we send them to their official addresses. And uh, we got no response from them. So that's, that was some of the other facts that I thought I'd like to say. And before I ask uh, Justice Shah to speak and comment on what has been said, Soda, you'd like to add a few points? Yes. No, uh, I think one very important thing that has been pointed out, why, I mean, in this particular case, what we see, uh, the Birla papers are found in 2013 while the CBI is investigating the Colgate scam. And the, uh, the Sahara papers come a year later, after the elections. Uh, but the thing is, say, for example, the appointment of K.V. Chaudhary as the Central uh, Vigilance Commissioner, it gets passed not just by the, the Prime Minister and the Home Minister from the BJP, but also the leader of the largest party, in, uh, the second largest party in the uh, parliament, uh, from the Congress, Mr. Mallikarjan uh, Kharge. Uh, Mallikarjan Kharge. Um, and so basically, what we've been trying to trace here is not that this particular government is at fault here, but what are the exact policies and the limits on which probity can be asked for in public life because of the way our system is set up. Uh, so what I'd like, uh, probably, uh, uh, Justice Shah could uh, shed some more light on, as a member of the um, uh, Center, Center for Whistle, uh, Protection of Whistleblowers, you had uh, gone on public and uh, raised criticism of the interpretation of the Indian Evidence Act. Whistleblowers Forum. Uh, sorry, uh, Protection of Whistleblowers, uh, Whistleblowers Forum. Um, in the way the Evidence Act, a colonial era law which is now more than 160 years old, and how that was interpreted in this particular matter, so basically, we can't look at the personalities involved, but what are the exact laws in place and what are the rules, right? So the Indian Evidence Act and also the way in which benches have been set, because this is something that came out after the press conference held in the beginning of last year by the four senior most judges after the Chief Justice himself. Uh, but in the way politically sensitive benches have been set over the years, so the rules regarding that and the appointments made. Over to, over to you, Shah. Justice Shah. Ha, ha, okay. And uh, we are recording the entire session. Ha, sit, sit. Ha, 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 sit. Uh, of facts of the cases, I would say. Let me go back to 1997. You will recall there was a case called Jain Hawala Diary. So these diaries were seized from the farmhouse of Jain brothers. And those diaries... Please, there are a few seats up in the front. Please come and sit up in the front, please. So those diaries contain entries, I mean like the, only the initials given. So for example, only LK, 
means it was presumed that it must be Mr. L. K. Advani and the amount was mentioned. Now, this was the material before the court. And of course, the, this, this is not adequate for conviction. And this bench was headed by Justice, Chief Justice J.S. Verma, one of the, uh, a very fine and courageous judge. So he quoted Lord Bingham, and I would like to quote this before you, I was, that very famous quotation, be you so high, law is above you. So this equality before law. And he said, he laid down the what is known as standard of impeccable integrity. He said that the a public servant is expected to be of impeccable integrity. There is a doubt. There is some material. There has to be some investigation. And a, a court monitor investigation was ordered. Ultimately, not enough evidence was found. The, the case was closed. That's a different issue. Now we go come back to 2013, when Birla were read it. This was a read by CBI. This was at the behest of the Supreme Court, because Supreme Court found that there was corruption in the coal allocation cases. So accordingly, the, Supreme, the, the CBI carried read. And as Prashant explained, this is a huge material. I mean, this is utter nonsense to say that the if the that loose pages are not compiled in a in a bound form and they are not maintained in a day to a regular course of business. So that's the requirement of section 34. They are not admissible in evidence. Now, if it is not the business of the company to pay illegal bribes, surely. So this can't be this cannot be kept maintained in in the course of business because these are all illegal payments. I mean, Section 34 requires some uh, a, a far wider interpretation. Be as they be. Now, this was a material which CBI could have easily started an investigation. CBI doesn't do. He simply sends the paper to the income tax department. So, income tax department, as Prashant said, it investigated into it. And it created a four volumes, I mean, report. It's a, it is a huge, and it's not, I'm not concerned with the personalities, whether Mr. Modi or anybody. You will, I mean, this is a, this is a curse to this nation. I'm, I'm on that. It's a, whether it's BJP, whether it's UPA, you'll find, I mean, there is one chapter by Paranjay saying, who's who? So practically, I mean, Many politicians belonging to different political parties were involved in this. And then the Sahara happened. Clear case of evidence that the, and very interesting defense was taken the, by, the, by Sahara. When they were confronted with the payment to Gujarat CM, the employee said, CM is Gujarat Alkali. Alkali chemicals. Alkali and chemicals. Alkali and chemicals. I don't know how this was. So the, this, was, this defense was rejected. And, the, and it was that these are illegal payments. So where from you got the cash recorded? To whom cash is paid? Recorded. The date of payment, the balance payment, who is the payee, who, who is the carrier of that payment, all facts are recorded. So these are the two cases which went to the Supreme Court. Now I would like to read what the, what the court said on this. And you decide whether really judiciary is anyway serious about the investigating this this uh, nexus between politic politicians and the corporate world as well as nexus with the corp politicians and the criminals now i'll just read one paragraph we are constrained to observe that the court has to be on guard while ordering investigation against any important constitutional functionary officers or any person in the absence of some cogent legally cognizable material. Now look at this material and the court says there's absence of material and look at the language that when you make an allegation against a high constitutional functionary, so it is really that the Bingham's quotation, I mean that is turned on its head 
because now you are you are making allegation against the high constitutional functionaries so will not interfere unless i mean how how do you prove a, a, an incident of corruption is it possible are you are you going to get some video uh, clips where the somebody is paying money to the, to a politician or to a, 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 a it's impossible to get that kind of direct evidence so it was a indirect evidence and then the last portion is in case we do so the investigation can be ordered as against any person who ever high in integrity on the so first you assume that they are all people with integrity on the basis of irrelevant or indecible invisible entry falsely made i mean where from this court get the it is falsely made it's all regular raids because the supreme court ordered cbi to carry raids and then and by any unscrupulous person or business house that do not kept in regular books of account but on random paper now how i mean is it conceivable that these payments which is this secret payments would be recorded in the books of accounts and the court said that this is not in the books of account and therefore and then what is important is the bench allocation is good that this young man raised this issue now this is one of the very important matters so it goes to judge number 12 the similarly the some other case went to judge number 14 then you will recall there was a judge who was in trying amit shah's case in mumbai so he 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 died in nagpur in allegedly in such such suspicious circumstances so that case was also was listed again to the same judge and in fact the four judges said or that in that conference they indicated in fact the present cgi indicated that the trigger point for the for this particular uh, press meeting was loya's case because this case was assigned to a particular judge so and then subsequently one of them said that the chief justice that chief justice was remotely controlled whatever it means then the we come to the other case which is kalikopul's case which is very briefly mentioned perhaps prashant had not enough time for that kalikopul was the was actually there was a congress government there was defection and the kalikopul became the chief minister so the whole thing was under challenge so ultimately in the floor test he got defeated and thereafter he committed suicide and he wrote a the supreme court actually uh, gave a judgment by which he was removed by which he was removed and thereafter he was uh, he, he 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 committed suicide so he he left a 60 page note i'm leaving aside the two judges named in that complaint that 60 page note refers to every project in the state and how much money went to politicians with names how they suppose 100 rupees are received from the center by of grant how this most of the money goes in the pockets of the middlemen of the politicians everything is described in great detail every page has been signed by him i am not saying that this is this is the uh, this is a, 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 this is a proof but there is a section in the ipc which says that the this statement made by a person before his death impending death it has it is admissible in evidence now this gentleman also made allegations against chief justice mishra the previous chief justice and the and the uh, justice k r singh who was the chief, chief justice earlier so the the law laid down in previous case of the supreme court again the supreme court i it is a well intentioned law but see how it is abused so that law is that if you if any investigation is to be started against a sitting judge of the high court or the supreme court then the cgis prior permission is necessary kalikopul's widow she approached some authorities police etc nobody took cognizance of that because naturally the judges were named so without the clearance from the chief justice this could not have been could not do investigation could have been ordered then she writes a letter to the cgi please grant me sanction to file an fir that's all so this is a matter before the chief justice on the administrative side because this decision whether to grant permission to 
investigate or prosecute is to be taken by the CGI in his administrative capacity. That's the law. Now, the, what Chief Justice of India does, Justice Kiyar Singh, is, is remarkable. He, he's, he treats this as a, as a public interest litigation, converts this later into a public interest litigation. Now, the, it's only an application for permission. Where is the question of any, any public interest litigation in that? Not only he does that, actually, if you ask me as a judge, I mean, when there is an allegation in a, in a letter or in a suicide note against the Chief Justice, the first thing you should have said, please, I have nothing to do with this. Let this be placed before the next man. If next man is named in the complaint, let it go before the next judge. It should, I, I mean, he should not have touched that letter because he himself was named in the complaint. So he gets it converted into a, 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 a PIL and it is again sent to judge number 14. Now the, and then ultimately when the, the lawyer for Kaliko Pool, a uh, widow, his widow uh, filed that petition, she saw the, uh, the lawyer saw the mood of the court, finally the petition was withdrawn, then some uh, ap applications were made to the vice president, president, etc. Nothing happened to it. So what is the ultimate message that the, that certain people in this country are above the law and they are untouchable. That's the message which at least I derive this that the, that's whether it's Mr. Modi or any other pop leader or particularly and, and this happens when the, now when you lose election and you are on the receiving side, then you, there will be, all agencies will be, will be activized uh, to, to actually uh, is in which false, true investigations against it. But that's not the, and the, I, I feel that the, the really the worrying part is the reluctance of the court to deal with these cases. The way the, this judgment is written by, by Justice Arun Mishra, he, he simply, this brushed aside, all the entire material was brushed aside. So these are worrying signs. So we had the heyday of the very judiciary was, I mean, at the, is, those were glorious days where Chief Justice Verma could say that you may be very high, but the law is above you. He had guts to tell the, the politician, political class of this country. So that's no longer there. Thank you. So, sorry. I, I'll, I'll just give you an opportunity. You are welcome to ask questions. Uh, yes, all of you are welcome to ask questions. I just want to make a few minor additions to what has been already said. Uh, and that is the role of the media. Much of the material that's in the book, not all of it, but much of the material in the book has been published in various newspapers, magazines and websites, including the Indian Express, including the Wire, among other places. Kalikopul's widow, that 60-page suicide note, is a document in the public domain. It, it is not only available on the website uh, of a, a non-government organization with which Prashant Bhushan is associated, the CJAR, uh, the Judicial Accountability and, and uh, Responsibility reforms. Uh, reforms. Campaign, for judicial. Campaign for Judicial Accountability and Reforms. She herself had come to the press club in Delhi and copies of this 60-page note were distributed to anybody and everybody who wanted it, who were present there. Now, it was all there in the public domain. But what we found is... The media itself, barring a few sections of it, chose to ignore it altogether and not follow it up. And, and the big question that has been raised earlier by Justice Shah and Prashant Bhushan before, why wasn't even an investigation done? You know, here we have a former governor who, by the way, was an appointee of the present ruling dispensation. He said this should be investigated. 
Why was even what is called the beginning a first information report or a preliminary inquiry not even begun? So without even getting into the merits or otherwise of these allegations, I thought I'd flag these points. And uh, now the floor is open to all of you. I'd request you to please identify yourself. And it might be good if you speak into a mic so that uh, we can hear you. And hello, hello. You're free to ask any question to any of the people over here. So actually hearing all of this, I think we just get so disillusioned and so disheartened you know, in the kind of country you are in. And you actually feel uh, you probably want to be in a bubble and not hear all of this. Because it's actually, uh, you don't know if this will ever get fixed. Do you think there is any fix to this? I mean, do you think? Can anything fix such, uh, you know, can any government, I mean, looking at the politicians the way they are, do you think there's any kind of a fix that these things might improve? Um, is there hope? I have great hope, but the hope is, I have hope in the people of this country. Not, in, no institution or no politician is going to come forward and going to fix the system. But surely, I mean, it's all people's power. I, I personally feel that the perhaps thing may change in the course of time. Let us hope for the best. But as it is, I mean, I, I share, uh, I can say that I share your disillusion, disillusionment, your depression. I mean, I beyond that, I don't know. Yes, please. Uh, maybe what we can do is we can get uh, more than one question. And then we'll get also the speakers to respond. Please do identify yourself. Sure. I'm, I'm Pallavi Sahani. I'm a chartered accountant by profession working with GenPAC. And uh, I think these, when, when you're hearing such issues, it literally burns you from inside. You know, you feel so passionately about your country, and such things really bother you. Madam, the darkest hour is before the dawn, just before the dawn. <laughs> That's hope. <laughs> yeah, my name is Kuljit Singh. Um, I just wanted to comment that uh, if you look at Pakistan, for the Panama Papers, uh, the Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif was jailed. Now, are you saying Pakistan's prime, uh, judiciary is stronger than India's, or is it only the army which is backing the judiciary? That's one question. The second is, uh, you know, the present government is postponed the appointment of the Lokpal. Uh, is the Lokpal a solution or will it be again another version of a CDC? Shukumar? Thank you. My name is Shukumar. I teach journalism at uh, Jindal University in Somnath. Uh, Father, I congratulate you on the book and I'm fascinated by the title. It says cases that could have shaken India, which is very fascinating. It should have, but has not have not yet. So I, I just recall that Prashant wrote a book not long ago, a few decades ago. Uh, it said the case that shook it. So, uh, so what has changed? I mean, <laughs> what has changed? At one time you could say definitely that this case can shake things up, but now you can't say. But uh, the point, uh, uh, the substantive point here, there was a reference to Justice Varma's uh, kind of uh, rulings in the Havala matter. And in fact, the legacy from that, from that uh, matter is, of course, the whole process by which high-level corruption is investigated, the whole process by which CBI chief is investigated, that is appointed. And the uh, chief vigilance commissioner functions as the, as the oversight <coughs> body. And now this whole system over 20 years has just kind of decayed and uh, crashed, right? So is there a, is there a, a kind of antidote to this because we all know that uh, it's infeasible for the Supreme Court of the country to act as, a, as an investigating magistracy, which is how Justice Verma took on the uh, Havala matter. He was effectively uh, supervising the investigation. So uh, uh, Lokpal, of course, which was just mentioned, is a possibility, but you know, we're still unsure about the best modalities of appointing the Lokpal and ensuring that it doesn't become <coughs> as fallible an institution as uh, as the CBC has turned out to be. So, um, so I just would like some kind of uh, 
One minute. He, he, he just We will take more questions, Chandanji. Uh, please go on. See, just the the first question about the about the Pakistan uh, Supreme Court's order. Now the gentleman has left, but it's, these are very important questions. So. Uh, if you, I mean, don't go by this, that particular judgment, which, which has uh, put uh, Nawaz Sari behind bars. But the, uh, the, as a quality of the judiciary independence, I mean, I would still say that the Indian judiciary is in quality and, uh, and the, leave aside this aspect, but this has given some wonderful judgments in recent times, privacy rights and many other. So this is really, our judiciary is, as though it has failed in certain aspects, it has a wonderful reputation all over the world. Uh, the second question is about the Lokpal. Uh, I honestly feel that this is a one solution. The, 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 the suggestion was that the CBI should be under the Lokpal. If you have an independent Lokpal and the CBI works under the Lokpal without any interference by the by the executive, perhaps this would be a, a, a reasonable solution. But I'm not sure. But the, there is, again, if, if the way the act is, as has been uh, uh, the scheme of the act, it, there are many loopholes. And the, uh, I don't think it is a very uh, satisfactory draft. I mean, they, this act was really enacted only because there was a huge pressure from Anna Azare. Prashant was also part of that moment. And this was in a great hurry, this act came into force, brought into force. But that is, it's quite likely that it will be, it will go the CBC way. Unless it is, it is really, the power of the Lokpal is strengthened. There is a more clarity on the, on the Lokpal's power. Now what I, I'm really surprised that the, after coming into power, one of the, that was the platform that actually the BJP's platform was anti-corruption. And that was obviously BJP, uh, I mean, fully supported uh, Adna Azari's movement. And from that day, from 2014 election till today, the Lokpal is not in place. I mean, every possible obstacle is raised uh, by the ruling party in, in actually make the statute, uh, uh, the, the law enforceable. Either there are many, for example, they say that there is no leader of opposition, so therefore Lokpal cannot be appointed, etc. All sorts of objections are taken. Even Whistleblower's Bill, that's a, the that's a most important act, Whistleblower's Bill. So that has been diluted by making some amendments. For example, one amendment is that if the information disclosed by the whistleblower is, is not permissible to be diverged under the right to information act, then whistleblower would not have any protection. That's the complete, uh, that's the end of the whistleblower. Uh, because this, these are all secret dealings, and this has nothing to do with the RTI anyway. So that I feel that the, that's a, that a Lokpal perhaps could be answer, but with the, uh, you need uh, uh, some tweaking with the existing Lokpal law. Uh, uh, one, one we it's okay, it doesn't matter. No, we are recording it. It's okay, I'll do it. Just hold it. So, uh, you see, we have always maintained during this uh, drafting of the Lokpal bill, that the, the, the bill that we had drafted, we had uh, grappled with this uh, uh, issue as to what are the things which can, nothing can ensure, but what are the things that are likely to minimize the likelihood of the Lokpal failing? Hmm. Now, Lokpal needed to be an independent institution. So, what are the things that guarantee its independence? First thing, that it should not be accountable to the government. 
Mm, it should be independent of the government. It should not be accountable to the government. Second, that the appointment should not be controlled by the government. Now, <clears throat> now let us see how the government controls appointments. So, for the CVC, there is a three member appointment committee. There is the prime minister, home minister and leader of opposition. Now, the home minister and the prime minister go together, leader of opposition can dissent. It does not count for anything. In the case of CBI chief, there is prime minister, leader of opposition and chief justice. Now, again, you have two politicians and a chief justice. Politicians, whether they are opposition or in the ruling party, they are not interested in strong, robust accountability institutions because they feel today he may be going after them, tomorrow he will go after us. So, therefore, because they hope to be in the government soon. So, we had in our Lokpal draft, we had suggested a broad based seven member selection committee in which there were some judges, there were CAG, there was uh, election commission and so on. There were many people involved in the selection, many independent authorities involved in the selection. And therefore, the chances of such a seven member body consisting of mostly independent people, only one person from the government, selecting somebody who is totally weak and pliable gets minimized. Then the question was, suppose the Lokpal itself misbehaves, suppose the Lokpal itself becomes corrupt, what do you do? So, we said all right, one way is to ensure that the Lokpal functions transparently. So, how will it function transparently? At least after the investigation is over, every detail of the investigation should be put out in the public so that the people should be able to see how was this case dealt with by the Lokpal. Second, we said that they should be audited by the CAG, there should be an annual audit by the CAG. Third, we said that uh, <clears throat> they should be accountable to somebody. So, we said that all right, let them be accountable to the Supreme Court by way of a complaint being made to the Supreme Court, etcetera. So, there are ways, there is nothing which can ensure that any institution functions well. There are only uh, ch checks that you can put in place or systems that you can put in place, which will minimize the chances of its failing. Unfortunately, the government tampered with our Lokpal draft and they brought in. So, today what you have in fact, the other day when this Lokpal case was heard in the Supreme Court. So, the government was so far not doing anything. Finally, they appointed a search committee. Then the search committee was also not meeting. For four months, they had not met. Finally, the court has said, all right, let the search committee meet and take a call, prepare a short list by end of February. Now, I said, ki, well, let them at least put out the decisions that the search committee takes in the public domain. We need to have some transparency in the functioning of the search committee as well as the selection committee, because the act itself says, the Lokpal act says that the selection committee shall function in a transparent manner. So, we said A, the decisions taken and B, the shortlisted name should be put out in the public domain. So, the court said, this chief justice said, you should be positive. They told me that you should be positive. Trust, these are all important people, trust them. Do not mistrust everybody. Why are you seeking transparency? Now, who are the people in the search committee? There is Mr. Ranjit Kumar who is a lawyer who was earlier solicitor general. Essentially, he will do what the government wants him to do. Then you have uh, Arundhati Bhattacharya. 
this former chairman of the State Bank of India who was happy to give this loan of 6,000 crores to Adani under the pressure of the Prime Minister when every 12 Australian banks had refused on the ground that that project is unviable. Prashant, that loan never materialized. I know it didn't materialize, but no, she had agreed to give a guarantee yes. that... Uh, yeah, MOU had been signed. Yeah. So... Uh, also mentioned uh, you have all that. kinds of dubious people in that such committee. Now... <clears throat> uh, so... One way of ensuring that they don't misconduct themselves, don't misbehave, don't act in a manner which is just driven by the government is to have some degree of transparency. But unfortunately, we find that, uh, of course, the government doesn't want any transparency, but uh, even the courts are sometimes, I mean, the Supreme Court, which has given all these judgments that look, right to information is a fundamental right. So many judgments, starting from Raj Narayan, S. P. Gupta, and so on, 1974 onwards. But today, they are reluctant to enforce even statutory provisions for transparency in the Act. Chalo, we have to finish. All right. Uh, yeah, uh, that uh, Mrs. Bhattacharya is now a director in uh, Reliance Industries. Reliance. 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 I, I met her. I met her recently uh, with a colleague of mine in connection with a book that I'm working on on uh, the incredible rise and rise of Gautam Adani. I'm hopeful it'll be coming out soon. Uh, we're still working on it. Uh, yeah, it is on record. So yeah, yeah. The oh my God, <laughs> Manish, don't do this to me. Okay, we we'll take a last round of questions. We have uh, two, uh, a few there. Uh, what I'll do is I'll ask everybody to keep their questions brief, their comments short, and then we'll get a last round of comments from uh, Justice Shah and Prashant Bhushan. Yeah, we'll start with you. Hello, sir. I'm Ajay Bhushan. This part of law has started working, and one thing which I want you was in our country, even though at the higher judiciary, the government per se does not have a say in the appointment of these judges. But as said by Mr. Mishra and Justice Shah, that the government is actively influencing the judiciary at the highest levels also. So how can we improve uh, this thing? How can we reduce the impact of the executive on the judiciary? Okay. We will, uh, your name please? Uh, Advait, sir. Advait. Okay. Yeah. Dilani. Hi, I'm uh, Ranjan, and uh, I'm a full-time litigant. Uh, I wanted to ask why has the quality of the judiciary gone down so much? You mentioned a lot of the factors just now. Why don't we uh, still have chief justices of the caliber of uh, K.V. Krishna Iyer and uh, Justice Varma, whom you mentioned? And uh, secondly, you know, I, I, I was just uh, I was a petitioner in a probate case. The quality of the judge is so bad, rather than awarding me a probate, he awarded me a sentence under section 209 and a 2 lakh fine uh, for absolutely frivolous reason, which I'm obviously going to appeal. But the man did not apply his judicial his, his, his judicial mind to even understand the case. He took a literal interpretation of documents. Uh, when we have such low quality of judges, what sort of justice do you expect to, to, to obtain? Mr. Bhushan, uh, Justice Shah, Mr. Brananjoy, uh, 
and Mr. Shah just said that things are really bad at the moment. Uh, I just uh, want to mention that uh, last year the parliament passed the Foreign Currency Regulation Act, and I don't know whether I'm wrong or right, that no scrutiny would be undertaken against uh, political foreign, for, uh, funding for political for parties. parties. And for every rupee which I have in my pocket is considered to be a black generated cash. Now, having said that, and the way things are, we are hearing about various instances, various examples of the, the Jain Hawara diaries. We have forgotten the Telgi, the yeah. paper stamp case, and many things going around us. Uh, can I call the parliament a den of corruption and not uh, be scared of being uh, termed uh, anti-national under any sedition laws? Thank you. Thank you. I'm Prashanko, former journalist. I work in public policy. Uh, I'm going to just add to that question Vivek had about legitimizing corruption. In the last uh, one year, we've seen some abrupt changes to policy. I've dealt with about seven or eight of them. Some of them are dealing existential blows to uh, multinational corporations. They're unprecedented because they'll happen without uh, consultation. And they all seem to favor one particular corporation. Uh, amazingly, it's probably coincidence or whatever. But the other coincidences, this has happened after the electoral bonds were issued. Would you like to name that corporation? Uh, well, it's one of them who, who have a special interest in you. Uh, so uh, now, these have also coincidentally happened after electoral bonds uh, were issued. And I'm just wondering how electoral bonds have changed the landscape of what you have uh, investigated and found. Okay. So I'm going to request first Justice Shah to make a few comments or observations, yes. then Prashant Bhushan, then Sorya. I'll be very brief. I mean, first response to your comment about the appointment process, the appointment of the quality of the judges. Now, the uh, I've, uh, 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 see, this present collegium system, I mean, suffers from serious uh, uh, issues of lack of transparency, self-breeding, it acts like a cabal, I mean, some club uh, where, the, uh, where there are no clear norms for appointment, and the many times the biases, favoritism, this, this play a great role in the appointment. So my first quick response is that the time has come, and I had written a piece in Indian Express recently, to do away with this, we should have this appointment commission. You may have a, a, a prominence to the judiciary in that commission, but we need to have an independent commission for appointment. We did not go into that issue in detail because that's not the subject. The other other issue which has raised is the, uh, I mean, I don't know much about it, but legitimizing that's a, I mean, a very stunning statement whether we should. It's not. It's not. It's a, any democracy. I mean, this would be unacceptable. But the, uh, I feel that the, uh, whether we should consider the, to permit lobbying to some extent, the, like the, the Americans or the, I, I'm not very sure because these ideas have never been discussed uh, in detail in Indian context. I mean, but that's one way about the, and the whole problem is uh, about the chronic capitalism is that the, that one, particular industry, industrialist or business house, which is close to the ruling party, gets the favor, I mean, apart from the bribery issue. So really, I mean, this time has come to have a rethinking on the, on the, on the, of the policies vis-a-vis -vis the businessmen. Prashant. So uh, one question was about how to reduce the influence of the government over the judges. So one way in which the government exercises influence is by the lure of post-retirement jobs. We have always said that that power to give post-retirement jobs to judges should not be with the government at all. It should be with an independent maybe a judicial appointments commission, which is completely independent of the government. Hmm. That kind of body should only decide which judge is to be given which job, if at all. I'm not saying that judges should not be given post-retirement jobs, but certainly government should not have any role in it. The second thing which this government has done, actually this is a new innovation of this government, 
to use intelligence agencies and investigative agencies to unearth some dirt about some son, son-in-law or some relative of a judge and use that to blackmail them. This is a new innovation that we have seen of this government. Now this is not easy to deal with. You have to have judges who do not have any chink in their armor by which they can be blackmailed. So unfortunately, that brings us to this question of quality of judges. Justice um, Shah said, we need to have a full-time judicial appointments commission, which is completely independent, which does this job in a proper scientific manner. Today, we are seeing a very haphazard uh, process of selecting judges, uh, nepotism, etc., is flourishing. And therefore, uh, uh, a lot of these problems are taking place. About this issue of legitimizing corruption, you see Kaushik Basu had once said a very important thing. Half of what he said was correct. He said that the bribe giver should not be punished, only the bribe taker should be punished. There is a half truth in that. The, if the bribe is being given for getting your legal entitlement, for example, very often the poor people, they are not being given their ration cards and in order which is their legal entitlement in order to get their ration card they are forced to pay a bribe there the bribe giver should not be punished hmm. but if you are giving a bribe for obtaining something beyond your legal entitlement then certainly you should be punished otherwise of course bribery can't be legitimized about electoral bonds See, electoral bonds has made it possible for companies to give bribes through electoral bonds without getting caught. So, uh, because electoral, the giver remains anonymous. Only the government is aware of that or can be aware of that because they can get the details from the banks. Nobody else is aware as to who has given this electoral bond to this political party. As, you, as we know, BJP has received 95 percent of the electoral bonds. A lot of it must be bribery, just sheer bribery. So that company has got some favor from the government and they have given a donation by way of an electoral bond. And obviously this is a bogus device and the reason uh, it's a corrupt device. It's corrupt, downright corrupt to have an anonymous instrument for donating to political parties. It's something which leg legitimizes corruption. It's something which promotes corruption and that is what is happening. So therefore, it's clearly something which was, instead of bringing about the reforms that we needed to have complete transparency about donations, today most political parties say that they have received 95% of their donations in petty cash. 1000 crore they received ki chadar phailai humne logon ne usme 10 rupaye 5 rupaye 15 rupaye dal diye aur humko 1000 crore rupaye mil gaye so and we don't know ki kisne de diye a lot of this money like the sahara people gave 40 crores to modi assuming that he didn't pocket it himself he would have given it to the political party to the bjp which declared ki humko 1000 crore rupaye mil gaye from petty donations so therefore therefore Instead of having more transparency, they have reduced whatever transparency there was. It's totally uh, wrong. Just, mm. I, yes. just uh, on the, uh, on the yes, corruption the business, right. because uh, so, uh, so I must uh, tell you something about the Convention Against Corruption. That's the international convention to which uh, India is a signatory. India has ratified this convention. Now, Convention Against Corruption targets three types of corruption. It's corrupt giving bribes to public officials, which like our Prevention of Corruption Act is first. Second corruption is that the, the citizen country, citizens of a particular country bribing public officials abroad. So to get businesses, to get contracts, so the, they, should be, they, are, they should be punished. And the third type of corruption is the private corruption. 
that's a corporate corruption that's a great britain and many other countries have brought law making it making a private corporate corruption as a crime but the the punishment is not mostly is not jail there are actually monetary very heavy monetary penalties when the a corporation is found indulging in corruption so for example a private company i mean in order to get the contract or individual in order to get a contract from a private company i mean bribes the high officials of that company it is also a crime and therefore and as per the convention against corruption both should be both are liable that's there the international convention is very clear that both bribe giver and bribe taker are both are but not as prashant says that it is in small cases i'm not on those cases the where the it's a big ticket corruption what you can say so there i mean both should be liable in fact the under the amended prevention of corruption act the bribe give bribe giver is also liable to be punished but the sentence is relatively lower but we have actually in the law commission i made a report on the on the all three types of corruption so the government said that they would bring a separate legislation on private corruption but i think the present looking at the nexus between the the government and the corporate i don't think this will will be ever come in the parliament uh, yeah like um, i was introduced as a young person so i'll answer as a young person uh, the jain hawala case which uh, has a long history it's been covered in the book uh the amount involved was 64 crores uh, as a young person 64 crore rupees in political corruption doesn't mean anything at all it's probably not even worth investigating it's petty money by today's standards back then 115 top politicians was were involved it was a national issue the changes that have been ha happening i mean in principle i don't see anything wrong with the investigative agency being controlled by a political a rep elected representative but the problem is elected representatives today have to uh, abide by a set of interests because to win an election in this country is so expensive you cannot do otherwise so as was mentioned uh, i mean on the question of legalizing bribery I, i would argue that it is being legalized in several ways for example the fcra where even a foreign company could give political donations with the assumption that there will be some quid, quid pro quo at some point <clears throat> i mean uh, post colonial countries such as ours have always had this kind of a distance between electoral politics and uh, the economy Uh, but like say more advanced capitalist countries such as the USA this relationship has always been very close it's been called lobbying and it's always been an ad something that has been admitted here till recently for the prime minister to feature an ad for a private company would make people go up in arms i mean that would be something that would leave people flabbergasted today we don't see that as such a big deal because we know which direction our polity is going so i think realistically uh say something like an independent body is probably the more pragmatic approach but in the longer term unless something that we can all i think com come to a consensus on the problem of uh financing uh politics in this country and transparency in that process is going to be crucial to determine which set of interests ultimately rule and, and yeah yeah Well, uh, we've come to the end of this evening's discussion. Kulji ji, you were not here. Justice Shah responded about, you know, in what sense yes. Pakistan. Uh, sorry, uh, just about, about that's all right. Uh, you know, Nawaz Sharif is behind bars. He's suffering from cancer. His wife passed away. He's still behind bars because of the revelations in the Panama Papers. Are we better? Are we worse? You know, I mean, what is the yardstick for? comparison i mean this is something that we can talk all night about as as soria my young friend and colleague and the lead author of this book has rightly pointed out at the end of the day it's how elections are funded how political parties are funded and and how those who stand for elections how they uh, campaign and how how they how they are funded uh, in a sense that's really uh, where it all begins and and uh, then it spreads like cancer across the political economy 
of this country. Uh, uh, and uh, we, we can talk about what's happening in other parts of the world, but at the end of the day, uh, we like to believe that we are here in, 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 in we in India, we, we like to believe that, you know, I'd like to be optimistic. And therefore, I do believe that at the end of the day, there will be progress, even if that change uh, is incremental, not as fast as many would like. And yes, there is good reason to be pessimistic, but yes, the darkest hour is always just before the dawn. So I want to take this occasion on a personal note to thank my family, my wife, my father-in-law, uh, our two children, Triveni and Purna Jyoti. Tomorrow marks the third death anniversary of my mother, who is no more, a dear friend of mine who also passed away. But uh, I thank all of you once again for coming here and being with us this evening. Thank you.